You good? All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Pres Clarksville. Uh, glad that you could all be here. Those of you who are watching there on Facebook Live, glad that you all could be with us as well. Uh, if you're visiting with us, and I do see a, new, a few new faces uh, here today, especially glad that you could be here. Uh, seriously, it really is a, a joy that you would come out um, on a um, blah sort of looking Sunday morning, right? Not, not the easiest day to get up and get, get going out of bed and such. But um, we're going to uh, start off with just a few announcements, uh, just a few things I want to make sure that everybody is aware of going on in the life of our body, and I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. So the first thing being, next Sunday we are celebrating the Lord's Supper, and so would encourage you to be in prayerful preparation for that time. want to make sure that's something that we do the first of every month, and uh, next month being the first Sunday uh, of the month, that's what we're uh, going to be doing. A prayer meeting, we do have one coming up. Uh, we've been doing these for the last several months uh, online via Zoom, and it's pretty good participation in that. We have another one coming up uh, November the 12th, and if you'd like to be a part of that, if you'd like uh, literally a part in that, which is how we're running these, uh, I'd encourage you to, you can see the information there in the bulletin if you've uh, printed that out, or in the newsletter. Pretty much everything that I'm about to say is also uh, in the, the uh, newsletters that we have coming out every Wednesday. Uh, so that's coming up on November the 12th. Um, Let's see, Dave Chapman, where are you? You got something for us, right? Good morning. Okay, uh, like uh, Richard said, I'm Dave Chapman, and I'm in charge of the emergency response team, also known as ERT. Everybody here hear that? Know what it is? What it is is a group of us men that uh, we help take care of everybody every Sunday morning. <laughs> we have someone posted inside the sanctuary, someone posted out in the hallway. We track everything from bad weather to keeping an eye on your vehicles in the parking lot and all the way up to and including, God forbid, an active shootings type situation. So what I'm doing is I'm recruiting now. I need three men willing to serve on the ERT team. Now, the pay's not real well, okay? But the retirement program that we have is out of this world, okay? So if you're interested, you know, anyone in here, those of you who are watching at home, just get with me. I'm in the bulletin. Uh, give me a call. Text me. Email me and uh, we'll get together and see what we can uh, get done to make happen. And like I said, I'm Dave Chapman, and I approve of this message. <laughs> oh, Dave. Thank you. Um, let's see. What else do we have in terms of other teams? I've been talking the last several weeks. We've been talking the last several weeks about uh, some folks that are, some teams that are going to kind of restarted and, and refreshed a bit here. And so the hospitality team is certainly one of those. And its mission basically is to create as welcoming an environment on Sunday mornings as possible. And so if you are interested in participating in that and, and lending assistance to that, it's a very important, a vital, vital uh, ministry. Uh, Ashley Lazondak is your contact, and that's in the bulletin as well as in the newsletter. Uh, also, uh, Tina Lee, where's Tina? There you are. Uh, contact her if you'd like to help us out as we're trying to get the nursery going again and, uh, and also thinking about um, children's church after that and how we can best do that. And, but we can only do that with manpower, right? So, Tina, I know we'd love to, to hear from you on, on that score. All, uh, speaking on, on that point, we do have space available today, uh, as we've been saying the last several weeks, we do have space available today if you, you, you or your child needs a break in the course of the service. It's a room right out to the right. It, it's the normal nursery room. Uh, you, however, are the volunteer staffing, okay? Just want to make sure that we're aware of that. that that's the space is available, uh, and you are the staffing, uh, said parent or, or parents of said child. So just want to make sure we're, uh, you know that we have that available, at least the space today. I think that's about it. Stephen Lee had something. All right. So something that we don't do enough of um, is to thank our pastor and his family for their sacrifice and dedication 
to our church and congregation and community. And uh, one of the ways that we can do that, and you have participated in this, the elders, deacons in session, and leadership in the church, um, uh, want to give you a gift. So this is from your church, and we appreciate it. Another way is to continue to pray for this dear family, and we want to do that this morning. Um, every day, every week, if you can. Um, and there are people praying for you weekly. So let's pray just briefly. Father, thank you uh, for the Swartz family. Thank you for Richard and his weekly faithfulness to study and prepare and bring the gospel to us through your word enlighten his heart his mind each week set that time aside uh, that he desires and needs to do that preparation guard it protect it Lord cause us to be faithful in our prayer and intercession for he and his family for Sarah for Hannah and um, Andrew and Waylon, for Emma and Alex, uh, we appreciate them so much and the faithfulness that they have demonstrated uh, through their service to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, I won't dwell on the thanks and the humility I feel here at the moment for fear my Emotions may get a little too tangled, uh, but thank you, all of you, Stephen, and all of you. Um, I want to start us off with reading a quote here from, and if you printed it out, it's in your quotes and notes, and it's very much the theme of, uh, taps into the theme of our morning. Uh, we've been talking about this leading up to this, up, this Sunday, this Sunday being Reformation Sunday. This is it. Uh, this is it. We're finally here. I've been joking for years. One of these days, I'm going to stand up in front of you wearing a powdered wig and, and a big black robe. I actually have the black robe. I don't have the powdered wig, but I'm sure I could make arrangements. But we, I opted not to do that uh, yet again. I put it off yet another year. Maybe next year. Come back. You never know. Uh, Reformation Sunday. What, what is that? It's a Sunday marked in the church calendar uh, in a lot of different traditions. The Sunday that comes either on or before uh, Reformation Day, which is November the 1st, uh, and uh, well, that's actually All Hallows Day and All Hallowed Eve, which has been truncated and now being called Halloween. Uh, Halloween, um, it does, October 31st, 1517, uh, was the occasion in which Martin Luther, you may have heard of him, uh, did a thing. Uh, and he uh, nailed some statements to a door in a little town named Wittenberg in Germany. And that, uh, it wasn't everything, but boy, it sure set off, it, it was sort of like the spark that set off a powder keg that we know today as the Reformation. And so wanting to mark that and recognize the value and importance of that in world history, not just church history, but really world history as well, a lot of times, a lot of churches and certain traditions set aside one Sunday a year to talk about what has the Lord done in the course of the centuries of his dealings with his people. So we've done all kinds of different things along the, those lines through the years, uh, most especially looking at certain individuals in the course of church history, everybody from, I think, as far back as St. Augustine, as far forward in history, I believe the most uh, contemporary would have been C.S. Lewis uh, years ago. We, we looked at his life as well. And not to glorify the people the men or the women. No, 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 not, not in any way to do that. We are not about sainting anyone. Uh, but what we're simply saying is let's take a look at what the Lord has done in and through their lives and how we, on, on the, through the streams of history, have been enriched and can, what we can learn uh, from through the way the gospel has impacted these people and through, and through them us. Well, we're not doing a person this year. We're, we're doing a, a thing, a movement, and it's called Revival. It's called revival, and we're going to be looking at that as the, um, later on here in the morning, and the readings are driven in that direction, and the songs are driven in that direction, and I want to read to you these words from a gentleman by the name of Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lloyd-Jones. 
Uh, he, back in the 20th century, in the mid part of the 20th century, would have been very well known. I wouldn't have doubted if everybody, well, we wouldn't have been here during that time. But anyway, uh, he was the, the pastor at Westminster uh, Abbey there in London uh, for something like 50 years. Brilliant man, uh, not just a pastor. He's actually a physician in his uh, first career. Uh, and Lloyd-Jones was passionate about this topic of revival, preached on it a lot, studied on it a lot, taught on it a lot, tried to keep it in front of his people as much as he possibly could, and, and wrote a very good book on the topic as well, from which, finally, you're wondering, where is he going to land this plane? Uh, a great quote here in our quotes and notes that I want to read to you from that, that book. Lloyd-Jones said, I am profoundly convinced that the greatest need in the world today is revival in the church of God. Yet alas, the whole idea of revival seems to have become strange to so many good Christian people. There are some who even seem to resent the very idea and actually speak and write against it. Such an attitude is due to both a serious misunderstanding of the scriptures and to a woeful ignorance of the history of the church. Anything, therefore, that can instruct God's people in this matter is very welcome. Well, that's the plan for today, is make Lloyd-Jones feel a little bit better. Uh, talking about revival, knowing in all seriousness, getting, are getting serious about the, a very, something that's abundant biblical testimony to. And certainly no little historical precedent as well. So with that, let's prepare arts now for worship.
call to worship this morning comes from Psalms chapter 33, 1 through 5. So as you are able, please stand and read along with me. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we worship and adore you. You are faithful in every way, and we praise your name. You have chosen us to be your own, and we are grateful for your love for us. We thank you for being here among us this morning. We love you. Help us to love you more. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue to worship in song. Bring us shine on me. 
The scripture reading is from Isaiah 35, verses 1 through 10. Strengthen the weak hand, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unsought. Then the lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground a spring of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heart, on their heads, they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Please bow with me for prayer. Lord, we've read in this passage that your grace never leaves your people without hope even when you discipline their sin. Even where there was a defiant nation, this passage is a glorious promise of restoration given to your covenant people. Be strong, it says. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and the recompense. He will come and save you. You, Lord, gave this vision to encourage the few citizens of Judah who trusted you when Isaiah called for strength, strengthening of the weak hands and feeble knees in this passage. He was speaking to a people that, was, that were hunched over in deep depression and discouragement. And when, people, when the people ask, where is our God in this trouble? In the exile that is to come, they asked, God's answer was, I have not left you, I have come to redeem you. And Lord, indeed, uh, you have redeemed us through Christ, and our hope is in Christ alone. There is good news for all who trust in you, Lord. Everlasting joy is coming. That is our true hope. Speak to our hearts through your word this morning. It's in your name we pray. Please stand as we continue singing.
Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Our next scripture reading is found in Acts chapter 2, reading verses 37 through 47. Hear the word of God. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brother, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. Dear Lord, dear Heavenly Father, you are the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of all things visible and invisible the Father who sent his only Son to die for our sins, the Father who gives us his Spirit to teach and guide us, to help us in our weakness, and to intercede for us. We confess our sins and our utter need for a Savior. We confess the sins of pride in our accomplishments, as well as the sins of anxiety and fear of our failures. Humble us to admit that all our accomplishments are gifts from you. At the same time, you will not fail us, and this comfort does indeed bring great peace. We confess our sins of unbelief. We confess the failures of the church and the vital need for revival. We thank you for your innumerable mercies. We thank you for your love and provision. We thank you for the perfect example that you have given us as the church's bridegroom. We thank you for your spirit who dwells in our midst. We thank you for the precious blood of your son that rescued us from death and damnation and gave us eternal life. We cannot conquer sin merely by altering our behavior. For the root of our depravity lies in our own hearts. Because of this, we humbly come before you with our needs. Help us to show grace to one another. Help us to love one another. Make us mindful of our utter dependence on you. Give us faith. Give us reliance on you. Give us revival. As your church, we pray that there may be no division in the body, but that members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We pray for our civil leaders. We pray for their work in governing, that it might be honoring to you, and that they may show love to one another as we are commanded to love our neighbor. We also, out of love, pray for the salvation of each of these leaders. We pray for our local leaders. We pray for Montgomery County Mayor Jim Durrett and Clarksville Mayor Joe Pitts. 
We pray for Tennessee Governor Bill Lee and Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally. We pray for U.S. Senators Marsha Blackburn and Lamar Alexander. We pray for our U.S. Congressman, Dr. Mark Green. Father God, we pray for President Donald Trump. We pray for Vice President Mike Pence. We pray for the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell. We ask your blessings on their health, on their families, and on their governance. Help us as individuals and as a church to keep our conduct honorable and to glorify you in all our thoughts, words, and deeds. Be with our pastor as he brings your word to us today. Love and protect the Swartz family throughout the week. We pray for revival. As we, song, as we sing, we pray, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for the message, please stand and let's continue singing. So why study church history? Why is this something that we should even talk about? Well, you know, some of you I'm sure have heard the adage that uh, those of us who are ignorant 
of history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. Well, that's certainly a truism that would be applicable in this case, but I think we can go actually a little further and, uh, and put it this way, that as, as certainly as believers, we need to, to simply say that those of us who are ignorant of God's dealings with us are hampered, are hindered in their ability to give Him the praise that He is due for His dealings with us in the past. If we don't know what He's done, we can't praise Him for what He has done. But, and equally so, we would also have to say that not only are we hindered from praising Him, we are hindered from praying to Him regarding our needs for the present and, and the future. Or if I can just put it, put it this way, how He has shown Himself, or rather who He has shown Himself to be in the past should shape and transform our view and expectations of the future. As the Scriptures say, He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So who has He shown Himself to be in the past? Because whoever that is, that is who He is now and forever will be. So again, it's getting at back to the, the answer to the question, why bother even studying and reflecting on, on these things? Well, as I said earlier, as we've been talking about it sporadically through the service, we're going to be looking at the topic of revival in, in two ways, on two fronts. Uh, first would be the biblical teaching on the topic, and we don't have time. We'd have to spend all day uh, if we were really to do, be thorough on that score. So just a sampling of some of the biblical teaching on the topic, and then equally so, just a sampling on the historical witness that bears out the reality of the biblical evidence, okay? So we're going to kind of be tacking back and forth. This is, going to, this is part preaching, it's part teaching, it's part theology, it's part history. It's a little bit of a, a hodgepodge here, here this morning, okay? Uh, so we're going to start, though, with Psalm 80. Uh, that's the passage that we want to begin with. Uh, Psalm 80, if you've got a Bible, I'd ask you to turn there now with me. Uh, Psalm 80, the Psalms are right there in the very heart of the Bible. In fact, it's not just in terms of the number of pages cracking it open, but I mean like it is the heart. The Psalms are the heart of the Scriptures, and Psalm 80 is certainly no exception here, and it is just one of several that we could have begun our time with. Hear now the word of God. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim. Shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove it, drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its, preach, its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move on in the field feed on it. Turn again, O Lord of God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Well, let's pray together for a moment. Lord Jesus, you are the author of all life, physical and spiritual, the creator and recreator, the designer and restorer. And we ask that you would help us to understand the implications of that. We ask that you would indeed enliven our hope this morning to see that 
what we read of in the Scriptures, indeed what we read of, of dealings with your people through the ages across all lands and times and cultures to breathe new life where the embers have gone dim. That is not something that can't happen again. And we ask that you would help us to see and to pray accordingly, even through this because of, even perhaps because of this little bit of time we spend together here this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. Bear with me as I give you a little bit of cultural analysis, okay? This is from a gentleman by the name of William Cooper. Uh, William Cooper wrote, Now for a great while it has been a dead and barren time without fruit in all the churches of the Reformation. The showers of blessing have been restrained. The influence of the Spirit stopped. The gospel has not had any famous success. Conversions have been rare and dubious. Few sons and daughters have been born to God. The hearts of Christians are not as lively, warm, and refreshed under the ordinances of the Word and sacrament as they have been. The Christian faith has been in this sad state in this land for many years. There are one or two well-known exceptions. This sad state is acknowledged by all who have any spiritual awareness. Now, I didn't tell you William Cooper is not writing this about the 21st century West. I should have told you that William Cooper is actually writing about the American colonies in the early 18th century, pre-Revolution America. He's writing in a preface, in an introduction to, in November 1741, in a book, for a book by Jonathan Edwards. So how's that land on you? Um, Cooper's words are, are striking. They could, of course, be said about our day today. But such men in such days did not engage in such cultural analysis and then walk away without any hope. That was not their response. Rather, they saw such days, such cultural analysis and understanding and dire seasons as an occasion, as an opportunity to turn to the living God, to the God of hope, and to pray, to cry out for him, to Him for intervention, for renewal, for what is oftentimes referred to as revival. They did not see such days, such times as cause for despair but rather grounds for prayer. Now, no few of us is here this morning, I know I'm not going out on a limb right now when I say this, are despairing of the cultural pulse of our day. Can I get an amen? People of God, do not despair. Pray. Pray for a movement of His Spirit. That is our calling. Not to waste our time wringing our hands in despair and dismay. The concern, of course, is real. Then, then as Cooper's saying, he's, he's not whitewashing anything. He's telling it as it is, like it is. But reckoning with the reality that, oh my goodness... The Lord Jesus himself has said, pray this way, hallowed be your name, which means, of course, that's his heart's longing, that his Father's name would be indeed hallowed. Now, lest you don't know what that means, let me tell you what that means. It means that God would be glorified, that he would be trusted, that he would be obeyed, that he would be imitated in all spheres of, of life. No more, no more dishonor or profaning of his name across the land. And oh, shall we say, also say, because we must, no more lukewarmness and deadness in his church. No more. Hallowed be your name. That's Jesus' heart. That's how we are to pray. And so you take that. And your cultural analysis, whenever and wherever it is, it causes you to be tempted to despair. And it ought to elicit, erupt within you a heart's cry for a reversal, a revival. And in fact, it's exactly what we see here. The Lord indeed has a solution in mind. It's not political. It's spiritual. 
The Lord has a solution in mind, revival. That's what we should seek. That's what we should seek. And as we do that, what we find are two things as we look here, delve into this a little bit here this morning. One is a growing appreciation for what revival is, and the, the biblical testimony there. And the other thing is a growing understanding of revival and the historical witness. And we're going to look at those, the, the two halves of that here for the next few minutes. So first, the appreciating of revival, the biblical testimony that we find, and again, this is just a sampling, just a sampling. Now, that's in three parts, and I got that by, just as a disclaimer, J.I. Packer, an article he wrote years and years ago on this topic, and I thought what he pointed out here in terms of just dividing up the categories of the evidence was very helpful. So there's three. First, the prayers. Second, the pictures. And third, the accounts that you find in the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, of revival. The first having to do with prayers. So the circumstances, typically what you find is the church, God's people, reckon with the reality of their weakness and ineffectiveness as they find themselves under the discipline of God's hand. And so therein is a cry, a plea to him to have mercy, to have mercy. Psalm 80, we just read that. Let me come back to it now. Don't know if you picked up on this, but there is a refrain in Psalm 80. And it's three times. It's almost identical, but it's not quite. It's actually building in intensity with each one of these refrains that you see in Psalm 80. Psalm 80, verse 3, Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Verse 7, Restore us, O God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. Verse 19, Restore us, O Lord God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. Or another text we could spend some time in, we're not just for time's sake, but Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3, it's, it's a passage oftentimes when the topic of revival is uh, preached or taught on. Habakkuk 3 verse 2, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. O oh, Lord God, have mercy upon us. Breathe fresh life into these bones and revive us and renew us and restore us once again. So that's something, a sampling of the prayers. Again, we could spend a lot more time just on that. And then you have the pictures. The pictures, you see this especially in, in the prophets and, and the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, we have a lot of that, especially in Isaiah. We had a reading from one of those pictures just a little while ago. You see it also in the minor prophets, uh, in, especially in the book of Joel and then Zechariah. Here's a sampling from Zechariah in the midst of a much larger passage, Zechariah 10, verses 6 through 12, I will strengthen the house of Judah. And I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. And they shall be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God and will answer them. And Ephraim shall become like a mighty warrior. And their hearts shall be as glad as with wine. Their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them in. For I have redeemed them. And they shall be as many as they were before. Though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me. And with their children they shall live and return. I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them to the land of Gilead and to Lebanon till there is no room for them. He shall pass through the sea of troubles and strike down the waves of the sea. And all the depths of the Nile shall be dried up. The pride of Assyria shall be laid low. And the scepter of Egypt shall depart. I will make them strong in the Lord. And they shall walk in his name, declares the Lord. Now, I, just a quick aside. These readings from all the prophets, major or minor, have their own specific historical context. That's true. That's true. But they are also pointing to permanent abiding principles that illustrate the way the Lord works in such times, in such contexts, with his people as they cry out to him, revive us, renew us, have mercy upon us. So you have the prayers, you have the pictures, you also have the accounts, the, the, the narratives, uh, the texts that speak of times when it happened. 
You see it in the New Testament, certainly in the book of Acts. In the early chapters of the book of Acts, several incidences of this. We read of one of those just a little while ago. In the Old Testament, you see it in several of the kings. Uh, sadly, not all of them. Uh, that's why you had to have those times. But you see it in the reigns of such men as Asa and Hezekiah. And in the years, not a king, but in the years... Uh, the governance of men such as Ezra and Nehemiah. But one of my favorite, and I want to take you there, is, is in, during the reign of King Josiah. King Josiah, this is recorded for us in 2 Chronicles 29, or excuse me, 2 Chronicles 34. 2 Chronicles 34, verses 19 to 21, in the midst of a much larger passage and flow of events, but you'll get the idea just when I read just this little bit here. 2 Chronicles 34, 19 through 21, this revival that takes place in the midst of Josiah's reign. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Asaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go! Inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in the book. And then you, you read the, the larger context of everything you're reading about Josiah and you come to realize, oh my goodness, that was so dramatic and so amazing, this turning that took place in, in the hearts and lives of God's people. The idea being here, the biblical teaching, the evidence, the testimony is very clear that there are times when God moves to awaken, to revive, to renew, to rekindle the flame within the hearts of His people. And as we come to grapple with something of that, it ought to cause our hearts to appreciate something of the wonder of such a work. And maybe, maybe whet our appetite with anticipation and hope that it could come again. That it could come again. So let me, let me give you an illustration of something like that. As it did come again. As it did come again. Uh, let's go to the early part of the 19th century and what's oftentimes referred to as the Second Great Awakening. Now, these words I want to read to you from a gentleman by the name of James McGreedy and the stirrings not that far away from here, folks. Logan County, Kentucky, in a place rightly referred to as Rogue's Harbor, okay? And there in that place, uh, it was July 1800, and some 8,000 people came from as far as 100 miles away gathering to, at Rogues Harbor in Logan County. And after three days of meetings, a Presbyterian, that's right, it's possible, a Presbyterian pastor by the name of William McGee stands up and he commences to preach. Now, these are the words of James McGreedy as he's observing and documenting for us what happened. The power of God seemed to shake the whole assembly. Towards the close of the sermon, the cries of the distressed arose almost as loud as his voice. After the congregation was dismissed, the solemnity increased till the greater part of the multitude seemed engaged in the most solemn manner. No person seemed to wish to go home. Hunger and sleep seemed to affect nobody. Eternal things were the vast concern. Here, awakening and converting work was to be found in every part of the multitude, and even some things strangely and wonderfully new to me. This was just the start of something that took hold, spread, and lasted for several decades. It's what historians, honest historians, document and speak of as the Second Great Awakening. You can look it up. There's a whole lot more to talk about there. I, I don't know if you've, you're familiar with any of this. But perhaps some of this is new to you. Maybe the idea, the possibility of something even happening in, in our day is just completely novel. To us here. And that, that would be tragic. Remember what Lloyd Jones said, right? The greatest hope of the world today is what? Revival. And yet we seem to know next to nothing about it. 
and talk next to nothing about it. But again, again, the idea is that it's not, it's not, just, it's not just in the, the lives of us as individuals where the spiritual fires can burn low. We know that all too well. But it's also true that those fires can burn low collectively. And in such days, the Lord has shown that there are times when according to His wisdom and His timing, that He blows upon those dying embers and causes them to burn and burst aflame. And it's an amazing thing to behold. And folks, it can happen again. The evidence is in. It can happen again. Now, I just ask you, I just wonder, I say that. You've heard some, some testimony here already. What does that do in your heart right now? The idea that this could happen again. Are you skeptical? Are you hopeful? Are you puzzled? Some mixture of all three? It's fine. But the question's worth asking, what's stirring in your heart right now? We're talking about this. The Lord has provided something for us here, a solution for us here, and it's called revival. That's what we should be seeking. All right, now let's shift the gears here if we can. Moving from an appreciation of revival as we're thinking about the biblical testimony to understanding a little bit more of revival as, as we look at the historical evidence as, as it bears out the biblical testimony. And I want to look at, at four things first, and it's there in your outline, the terms, the means, the pattern, the results. The terms, the means, the pattern, and results regarding revival. The terms, what are we talking about? What are we talking about when we use such language as, as revival? Let me be clear. What we're not talking about is something that can be scheduled. We, we are not talking about something that could be organized and orchestrated. We are not talking about, and I mean no disrespect, but we are not talking about something that you can see on a church sign that says revival this week. This is not something we can make happen. Therein, you cannot schedule it, organize it, massage it, plan on it. We're talking about something. Let me read you a quote from Richard Lovelace, who's written a lot about on this topic. He said, Revival is a work of God in which the church is both beautified and empowered through an intensification of the normal operations of the Holy Spirit. Or as J.I. Packer wrote, Revival is God's quickening visitation of His people touching their hearts and deepening His work of grace in their lives. You can't schedule that. It comes when and how it will. That's the terms, okay? We can't make it happen, but how does it come? How does it happen? Well, the means are worth considering here. Uh, and, and as we look back at the scriptural testimony and the historical testimony, it seems at least these three things are in play. When revival comes, one is a recovery of the gospel. The default setting of the human heart is self-righteousness. And that has to be attacked with the gospel, the finished work of Christ. The bad news being you're a whole lot worse than you thought, than you ever dared to fear. And the good news being amazingly praise God, you are so much more loved in Jesus than you ever dared to hope. That message has to catch. That's one of the, the, the qualifiers here. Another is corporate prayer. Wherever you see revival, there is prayer. In every instance, kingdom-oriented prayer. And not just private, not just everybody hanging out in their homes, but people gathering together corporately, sustained perhaps for years, praying. Kingdom-oriented, driven prayers together. Together. So prayer, uh, the gospel, prayer, and, and one is it's kind of hard to put my finger on, but in describe, I'll call it creative measures. It's, it's fairly common, in the, especially in the history of revival, to look back and see, well, let me give you a for instance. So in the first and second great awakenings, outdoor preaching was a big thing. 
and it had never been done before. It was a novel idea, and some people thought it was ridiculous that you do that outside. Ah, but in the third, what's oftentimes called the third great awakening, there was none of that. It was all lay-led prayer meetings at lunchtime. As C.S. Lewis said, not about revival, but I'm just stealing the quote and bringing it out of context and using it here. You can't get back into Narnia the same way twice. And it's something like that with revival. Just because those songs worked last time doesn't mean we need to sing them this time. Maybe, I don't know. But that's, that's the kind of thing. It's the creative measures that you see in place time and again in the course of God's bringing forth revival. The means, the terms, the means, the pattern. What do you see? What's most oftentimes happening? It's interesting. I will just say a quick side note on this. The fact that there is a pattern throughout the ages and, you know, not, not being bound by any culture should tell us this is not just a human phenomenon. This is not just something that sociologists and anthropologists can study and say, oh, it's just a psychological thing. Let's do group study on it. No. This has the Holy Spirit's DNA on it. And that's why you see the pattern. Patterns such as a crisis, alluded to this earlier, a crisis comes about in, in the book of Acts, it's religious persecution. In the period of the judges, it was foreign oppression. In, in today, typically in the West, what, you, what is oftentimes happening is cultural decline and spiritual apostasy. And revival comes in the course of the crisis, a crying out from God's people. Deliver us, deliver us, as we come to understand our dependence upon the living God afresh and anew. A crying out, a visitation of the living God where, I even picked up, I don't remember which one of the songs, but the, the presence being recognized like anew and afresh. The reality of the presence of Jesus being known, not just talked about and felt and, and, and studied and debated theoretically, but known and embraced the living presence of, of Jesus and a, a stirring within uh, God's people such that sleepy Christians wake up and presumptive church members get converted and stuff happens. And the outside world takes note as this trans transformative effect is, is happening. And over the course of that, ripple affects the, the community, the society is changed. It's remarkable, these, these patterns that you see. And a result, what comes about because of this? Because of this. Well, Jonathan Edwards spent, no, I alluded to him in the William Cooper thing, and he wrote a lot about, Edwards did a lot about these things and spent a lot of time observing and reflecting on these things and wrote a book, short title, Distinguishing Marks. I forget, it's like the rest of it's almost the, that's why they had title pages back in those days because the titles were so long. Um, but the short title is Distinguishing Marks. And, and Edwards is, is, came up with five, five things that you can see when you know revival is coming. One, an elevated level of esteem for Jesus. He's no longer your life coach, but your Lord. An elevated esteem for Jesus, an attack against Satan's interest, sometimes even a frontal assault on the devil's ways and a curbing of sin in a culture. Thirdly, a higher regard for the Scriptures. The people of God turn to, can you believe it? What a crazy idea. Turn to the Word of God. Fourthly, the lifting up of sound doctrine. Truth is loved and lived out and no longer disparaged as being irrelevant or having no bearing on the practicalities of life. And then fifthly, hardly surprising, the producing of love to God and to man as hearts are warmed and the fruit of the Spirit is made evident. As Edwards points out, these marks are things that Satan wouldn't do if he could. And so you know when they're coming, this is a Spirit-led revival. Those five things, elevated the scene for Jesus, attack on Satan, high regard for scriptures, lifting up of sound doctrine, producing of love for one another. Let me, let me come back. I've mentioned the third great awakening a couple of times. Let me actually give you now an example of something along those lines. So it's 1857, 
through 1859. As I said, it began through a series of lay-led prayer meetings in New York City at lunchtime. But I, don't, I think it was started at noon and ended at one, like prompt, prompt, both sides. And uh, it just took, took off and spread to cities all over the country, impacting not just individuals, but society, the boroughs, the neighborhoods, in some cases, the whole city themselves, all over the nation. Here's a, a quote from this um, one scholar as he's looking back on this. The penitent owners of gambling saloons made them available for daily prayer meetings. Southern grocery keepers rolled out their barrels, poured their contents on the ground, and, quote, abandoned the traffic in ardent spirits. The chief of police in Atlanta, Georgia, maintained that the revival had so reduced the rate of crime that he could dispense with half his force. In the fourth ward of New York City, many, quote, haunts of sin and shame were shut up and hundreds of prostitutes were rescued. It's all documented. This happened. This happened. If we could have the time, we could spend the rest of the day reading accounts like this. Now, but what do we do with this? I mean, right now, you and I, this little group here this morning, what do we do with this? What do, we, what do we make of this? We can't make this happen. I cannot say that strongly enough. We can't make this happen, but here's what we can do. We can attend to the means. Remember those three means I said earlier? The gospel and prayer and the creative measures. We can attend to those things and take them like wood and put them on the altar and pray that the Lord of revival would send flame down from heaven. That's what we can do. That's what we must do. That's what we must do. And wait and see what he will do. He's provided a solution, folks. We don't need to despair. In fact, can I just say that would be wrong? Dishonoring to the Lord himself? So many other examples of testimonies I could read you. Uh, so far, all I've done is talk about things in, here in, in North America. I mean, we could spend some time speaking of things that happened in, in Wales, turn of the 19th and early 20th century, uh, India, Korea, China, early 20th century, East Africa in the mid-20th century. So many things even in the years since, lesser and greater degrees. I do want to just focus in on this last one. I haven't said anything, hardly anything about uh, documents or evidences from the first great awakening in New England and the middle colonies in the first half of the 18th century. This is one of my favorite accounts. Uh, I was reading it to, to Sarah just a few days ago. It's a first-hand account from a guy by the name of Nathan Cole. Now, Nathan Cole... Uh, was a, a Connecticut farmer, and he is describing a visit by the great preacher George Whitfield in that area, okay? And I'm just reading a, a, some excerpts from a much larger testimony that our, our friend Nathan Cole shares with us for posterity's sake. Here's what he said. Then on a sudden, in the morning about eight or nine of the clock, there came a messenger and said, Mr. Whitfield preached at Hartford and Wethersfield yesterday and is to preach at Middleton this morning at 10 of the clock. I was in my field at work. I dropped my tool that I had in my hand, ran home to my wife, telling her to make ready quickly to go and hear Mr. Whitfield preach at Middleton. Then run to, I ran to my pasture for my horse with all my might, fearing that I should be too late. Having my horse, I with my wife soon mounted the horse and went forward as fast as I thought the horse could bear, all the while fearing that we should be too late to hear the sermon. I know it's what y'all were thinking this morning on your way in, right? <laughs> For we had 12 miles to ride, double in little more than an hour, and we went round by the upper Housen Parish. And when we came within about a half a mile or a mile of the road that comes down from Hartford, Wethersfield, and Stepney to Middleton, on high land I saw before me a cloud or a fog rising. 
I first thought it came from the great river. But as I came nearer the road, I heard a noise, something like a low rumbling thunder, and presently found it was the noise of horses' feet. Every horse seemed to be going with all his might to carry his rider to hear news from heaven for the saving of souls. And my hearing him preach gave me a heart wound. By God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up, and I saw that my righteousness would not save me. Friends, that was the first American Revolution. And it was a whole lot more profound than the one we normally talk about. Um, Again, I, I, I don't think we can say this strongly enough. These are real people in real places. Had we the time today, we could get in the car and do some road trips and visit the sites. I have no idea if we'd find historical markers, but the places are there. The places are there. As I was saying to a friend of mine just the other day, there is no firewall between our day and those days. It's not there except in our imaginations. There's no barriers, no firewall, there's no anything. So I ask myself and I ask you, what's changed that we would think this can't happen? You tell me what? Jesus is still king. We are still his people. The Holy Spirit is still at work. And the Lord still hears prayer. So what's changed? He's given us the solution. Revival. That's what we need to seek. Can we pray? Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine. We may be saved. Amen. We are continuing here in this last part of our time of worship in the dedication of these tithes and offerings. And as we do that, I do want to read to you from Matthew chapter 6. And to remind you, we do have those boxes there in the back, if that's, like, if that's how you'd like to, to give here this morning, or perhaps you're doing that online. Uh, in any case, we do want to take a moment to dedicate and entrust these things to the Lord. This passage here from Matthew 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, so profound. Jesus speaking to, to, to the deep spiritual dynamics that work within our hearts that come into play in such things. The eye is the lamp of the body, so... Your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And the light in you is darkness. How great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God money. We need that word this morning. Let's give with that in mind.
our Lord's benediction, sending us out into labor in His name in, his, in this land. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.